welcome to our first uh, lecture in the auditorium for this semester. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sharon Marum, chair of the architecture program. And I'm really happy to be able to introduce Florian Eidenberg today. Um, and I'm going to uh, give a pretty brief introduction because it's always uh, best to save time for the real meat of the matter. Um, but just uh, a few words uh, just to begin. So um, Florian Eidenberg is an internationally renowned architect with two decades of professional experience, including eight years at SANA, where he worked on projects such as the Toledo Glass Museum, which I know that quite a number of our students get to see while they're students here, and the new museum in New York. Um, he co-founded SOIL, Solid Objectives, in 2008 together with Jean Liu, an act of, well, I consider an act of daring at the start of the recession. It's really a kind of brave thing to do. Um, but you can see sort of that act of daring in the ways in which they developed their practice and the kinds of projects that they took on early on and sort of developed the practice out of. So I hope we'll get some opportunity to look at that today. And then in 2013, they were joined by a third partner, Ilias Papas Georgiou. <laughs> Um, Soil believes that through deep collaboration, architects can strengthen communities' ties to their environments. They know in an increasing digitized world, our architecture incorporates innovative physical materials that follow the unique scale and conceptual grounding of each project. So in an interview for CNN, Eidenberg stated... And this is a quote from him. He's turning red. Yeah. It's a good quote. <laughs> um, some architects maybe believe in architecture as sort of first aid, but we think of it more as preventative care. Good buildings are important for a good society. And so you can see how this is perhaps a really apt beginning to our lecture series this year um, and the college's Building Tomorrow agenda. Soil's work encompasses urban spaces, buildings for culture, residences, and workplaces on a variety of scales. And one of their first projects to bring them to the public eye was the MoMA PS1 courtyard, which they reconfigured as a multiple form of pole dance, or pole dances, I like to think of it. They've designed offices, a tent for the Frieze Art Fair, furniture for Knoll, which is quite fascinating, a revitalized public square in Paris, and their most recent completed project, the Minetti Schrem Museum of Arts at UC Davis, which I expect we'll get to see today. Um, his current research and some, well, some of his ongoing research investigates the future of work, workspaces and at least according to various online information, <laughs> he's developing a book on that, but I've just recently learned you can't trust everything you find online. Yes. Um, the firm has been featured in publications like the New York Times and Architectural Record, and they've re received recognitions including the Curb Groundbreakers Award and, as I mentioned earlier, MoMA's PS1 Young Architects Program Award. Um, their work is also collected in a number of institutions such as MoMA and the Art Institute of Chicago. So Florian is a graduate of Delft University of Technology, and this is where you have to be really careful. He's just recently changed where he's teaching. He's currently the Louis Sullivan Visiting Professor at MIT, and previously was an Associate Professor of Practice at Harvard University. So this should just be a lesson to you. You can't even always trust the information on the firm's website. Yeah. Um, he, the fir firm's website, and I believe this actually is true, <laughs> is both pragmatic and theoretical, um, and that they work across multiple countries and cultures with a, an extremely diverse set of staff and clientele um, in, a, in a rather collaborative setting, um, and collaboration seems to be a continuing theme of the work. Um, so with that, I'm going to thank him in advance for sharing his work with us and welcome him to Talman College. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Yeah, it was mostly true. Mostly true, mostly true. At that dinner, I guess, find out. Yes. No, I think actually everything was true. It was indeed a little bit embarrassing to hear it all uh, together uh, like that. Um, well, thank you for, uh, for having me. Um, we... We made a book um, two years ago. We're 10 years now. Uh, we started 2008, as mentioned, which is sort of a really bad time 
um, to start an office. Is this fine? This, the sound is fine, or yeah. Um, especially in office, interested in, in making uh, buildings, because at that moment, nobody was making uh, anything. Actually, most architects lost their job. Um, but we set out to start a practice that is really, uh, well, really much, very much believes that architecture is something that should be experienced, not just represented. Um, and so um, now, 10 years further, we realized, and actually in the making of this book, um, we we recognized because we went we just went at it we sort of did everything um, and but then working on that book we realized there's actually a, a, a number of themes a number of threads a number of um, ideas that keep on reoccurring in the work and so what I decided to do today is to actually speak about those uh, ideas so we're see, we're going to see a bunch of projects from the first projects to stuff that is actually currently on the on the drawing boards one image I just inserted right before we um, we entered. Um, and so, but it's organized around these ideas of open structure and open form, and it has a lot to do with our own um, idea of, of openness, of process, of participation, of a certain um, ability for contingency. And I, I, I realized that um, the president of this country also just spoke at the United Nations. I know that this is not such an esteemed um, uh, stage, um, but he spoke about uh, closing off, and uh, I think we're very interested in in a certain openness, and also think about how architecture actually can can participate in these conversations, um, not in a very direct or literal way. Of course, you can uh, decide to participate in some of this, but more in a conceptual way in how you conceive of projects that actually allow uh, the other in, uh, so to say. And so much of that thinking um, uh, comes out of, um, uh, well, or some of it comes out of um, an idea that Umberto Eco um, launched uh, back in the 60s uh, about the open work. And recently um, we did something in San Francisco with the open workshop. Um, 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 and I'm blanking quickly on this name, but anyway, we had a conversation about the role of, of sort of openness in the architectural project, and he uh, shared with me, uh, Niraj, he shared with me uh, two slides that he used then to explain this idea of the open work. It's quite simple, actually, but it is the idea that you design something to a certain level, um, and that you leave the, the, the audience, the, the, the other, in to sort of complete the work. So the work is not complete without the participation or the, the sort of um, um, yeah, uh, interpretation of um, uh, the audience or the other. So if traditionally, say, you try to create something as precise as possible and you want the person who experiences it or sees it also see it exactly in the same way that you see it and you envision it, that's sort of a closed work. But at the, at the moment that you allow for interpretation, you allow for multiple views, you allow for maybe misreading, you allow for misunderstanding, you allow for, you know, things that you maybe haven't seen necessarily yet, um, and that complete set of views, which might be contradictory views, are part of the work as well, or you conceive of the work in such way that it, that it opens up interpretation, it opens up uh, usage that you necessarily maybe haven't anticipated, that is sort of an open work. And so what, we, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm gonna speak about is a few projects to explain sort of these different notions. And rather than specifically speaking about open work, we sort of speak about uh, open structure and open form. And so hopefully these, these, uh, the projects that I will go through uh, help you um, explain sort of our thinking. Uh, and I will end with the Schrem Museum in which those two uh, come together. So, Pole dance uh, was a dance, um, tanz, basically it's called, uh, or uh, dance with sticks, which uh, Oscar Schlemmer, a Bauhaus uh, choreographer, came up with in 1928. And when we were asked in 2008 to do something for MoMA PS1 in the courtyard, right uh, at the height of the um, uh, crisis, the economic crisis, we started to think, what is, what is, what is MoMA? What is the, MoMA is actually the sort of treasurer of the, of the modern movement. They are the gatekeeper of modernity, so to say, this idea of design, and that through design, we can be in control, we can create structures that govern uh, our world. But at that moment, we realized that all these structures that we had sort of constructed, they were creating instability. They were not giving us um, something to hold on to. They were actually increasing unpredictability. 
And so this idea of the relationship between us as humans and the structures that we come up with, we thought would be an interesting thing to uh, think about for MoMA PS1 at that moment in 2008. Uh, 2009 is when it opened. So um, we started with this idea of the Cartesian grid, a very typical uh, white, um, um, uh, straight, rectilinear uh, grid, but one that is weak, one that doesn't often uh, offer uh, structure, but actually one that is um, collapsible, it's flexible, it's pliable, something which you actually as user are responsible for, uh, for giving its uh, stability. We envisioned covering the entire courtyard with this um, uh, grid made out of bungee cords, um, um, surf uh, poles, so they're glass fiber poles sitting on pivoting points. And so <clears throat> we wanted to have the user, the person who would uh, experience the space, realize their own effect on the stability of the structure. If you would touch one part of it, it would send a ripple through the system. And so suddenly the user becomes responsible to an extent uh, for the stability of that system rather than the other way uh, around. We envision some um, animators or activators, uh, hammocks, um, balls, um, uh, pulleys, so that people will really start playing with this system and start to see the interrelationship um, of, this, uh, of this project. Um, we presented it to MoMA. Um, and uh, we said this is a, a, an installation that's continuously on the verge of collapse. Um, they were quite uh, concerned specifically because there's a lot of people uh, drinking uh, and dancing um, in, in this installation during the summer. Um, but we said we had, we had engineered the whole thing with Bureau Happold, um, so they were fine. But Bureau Happold had done non-engineering because they said you can't engineer this system. You cannot actually not design something with so much uncertainty. All you can do is build it. And so we started to test um, uh, the day after we won to find out the, the, the sort of the balance, the equilibrium of this uh, system. And this is the first sort of afternoon and it seemed uh, promising. But then we went home and we got somebody sent us an image saying, can you please come and uh, clean up the mess you, you created in, um, in, the, in, the, in the courtyard. They had some donor uh, event going on. Um, and so what we did actually over time is just figure out the, in the process, in the making of it, figure out the right balance basically, the right sort of um, uh, equilibrium between sort of it being too taut and being too uh, weak. And so this is actually the only drawing that exists of this project, which is one that was constantly being calibrated. We worked with knotted, uh, connections and so ultimately at some point we found sort of the right sort of uh, yeah balance within uh, the system and so here you see it uh, at the opening you see a number of these colorful um, um, uh, balls they suggest a game but they, they are not a game they look like a game but they don't necessarily have rules they were there for people to come up with games. They, they, they could invent ways of using and starting to play uh, with this system. And so here you see a number of pictures uh, we found actually uh, online on social media where you see how people start to invent ways of using things that we you know, hadn't necessarily anticipated or, or thought about. So there's a certain openness in the elements that you put into that courtyard to start to create games and other uses that you don't necessarily think of um, at the beginning. Um, one of the things we certainly hadn't thought about was sent in by the lawyer from MoMA because we were actually uh, fully liable for any bodily harm um, that would occur in the courtyard. And this was one where they needed to ask if this was allowed or not. And so, you know, this is also something where we had to see how tolerant sort of are we for the interpretation of this, this use. Um, and then what happened is we worked with a number of other people. So once this system sort of was out in the world, people came to us and said, can we, can we do a project with you within that system. So indeed, we got approached by a, a dance group called Body and Pole, um, um, and they did uh, five performances in this installation, uh, and they created this uh, dance and choreography. Um, it was quite scary when they first, you know, climbed in these uh, uh, masts, but then, you know, eventually they found sort of a very beautiful way of, of, of uh, dancing, and they animated speakers. So we were approached by Arab, the, the engineers, to say, hey, can we do a sound piece in this, in this installation? So the small courtyard, we connected to a bunch of speakers, um, and in the... In these poles in the center, we put accelerometers, the stuff that's also in your phone that tracks where it is in space. And so by moving the poles, it started to animate the sound. And so suddenly this thing also became an instrument where eight people could play uh, together. 
And then we got approached by 2 by 4 the, the graphic design firm. They said, hey, once you have this information, once you know, you know where this stuff is digitally, we can maybe come up with an app or something where you can actually transform the sound. And so suddenly the installation became both a physical installation and also a digital installation where you could tap, you could sort of borrow one of these poles, uh, change the sound, and you know, affect basically the output of the, of the speakers. Um, and then somebody said, well, once we have that information of where the stuff is in space, maybe we can design a little graphic interface uh, that can then represent basically the movement of it. So you can actually show your mom uh, in the Netherlands, you know, how you are moving this stuff around. And so this is a very, this is for us a very important project. It was our first um, sort of project, but it helped us really think about, okay, how can you think of uh, an approach to design that allows others in uh, to imagine other um, yeah, other types of projects that you haven't necessarily uh, thought about. To allow, you need to allow it all to happen. Um, temporary installation, that's interesting. Then we thought, okay, how can you translate this idea of, of openness in a, into, a, into architecture, into a, permanent, um, into a permanent project? And so we did this. Um, um, yeah, we should ask this person to stop, though, at some point. <laughs> um, we, uh, we did a competition for um, a museum of contemporary art um, in... Um, uh, Belgium. Uh, now it's going to be. Do you think we can have them stop or it's going to. So they go on. I thought contractors typically leave at five. Um, okay. In any case, uh, a museum of contemporary art in, uh, in Belgium, in, um, in the northern uh, part in a city called Hasselt. And um, as you see, it's a beautiful old historic town. Uh, and it was a museum for contemporary art for new ideas, basically for this quite a conservative town. It was a public institution. And so uh, they needed to introduce these new ideas, but it was not necessarily blockbuster shows. It was really early sort of nascent uh, ideas that were presented there in this museum that had been uh, around for a while. And the scope was to, so this is the existing museum. Uh, this is the a building that was being demolished. And so the question was how to create a new uh, place here, and very much the question was also how do you open this up to the um, to the to the city, but we were hesitant because the city was very commercial and very dense and very touristy, and the the way the museum was organized was in this beautiful uh, old um, convent. Uh, here was a church. Here is where the nuns used to live, and the way you enter is through a, a gate into the museum over here. And we liked actually this idea of the filter or the edge, or in some way the threshold that creates some sort of distance between the city and the building itself. And so we started to think of what is this idea of this threshold? What is this idea of the the wall and the opening? Uh, the the existing um, um, building got its characteristics out of these sort of particular uh, openings. And we thought, can we think of a scheme, a design for for uh, art that isn't made yet for an audience that doesn't necessarily exist yet. That's a very young uh, audience. So how do you design for something that is so unpredictable? Um, and so we started to think of what is the infrastructure that they could uh, use for this. And so thinking of uh, a series of exhibition spaces that uh, use just wall and opening as the, basis, the basic design uh, element. Well, obviously we have the classic sort of organization of the enfilade, right, where you go from one room to the next to the next, which is a very classic way of telling uh, stories. But we thought for this more contemporary place, for a younger audience, um, there's not this interest in being sort of told top down what the narrative uh, needs to be. And we were interested in a more open curatorial approach where actually the visitor, the user, becomes the scripter, so to say, of their own uh, narrative. So if the traditional organization is maybe something like this from room to room to room, and maybe a more modern fluid space um, works like this. We got very interested in this idea of moving the opening actually to the corner of the room, which means that you, as a visitor, every time you come out of a room, you actually choose. You have three ways to go. You have three different um, stories you could uh, pursue, um, which 
very much more as maybe to do with the way we currently also experience, say, browsing online, where everybody sort of chooses their own path. And this would also open completely new ways of, of curation, right? Where you, where actually curator, curators could tell sort of much more complex and sort of multi-layered stories and where different routes and different sequences uh, would be possible. And so actually multiple narratives would be able to exist within a single um, exhibition infrastructure. Um, we decided to not just do an extension but actually use this thinking both in the old and the new. So the hatched is the, uh, is the old area that I showed and this is where the extension needs to happen. So we, we said we basically keep sort of the structure, the, 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 the sort of rhythm the, of, the, of the existing building and we just extend it. And then um, we, we, we um, create sort of a, a similar sort of series of, of rooms and we change both the, uh, the old and the new um, within this system. And so we bring these two uh, together within sort of basically a, a, yeah, a, a catalog of different types of spaces with this um, uh, connection between them. And so old and new actually come together by removal uh, rather than by um, addition. And so you see here how the building uh, sits. So um, again, here's the town. This is where the courtyard is. Uh, we made a, a, a sort of a, a more discreet opening uh, into the building, and this is the, the ground floor plan. And as you get closer to the garden, actually the, the building and these steps open up further, so to create a really a threshold from the city into the garden as sort of a, a, a filtering uh, through, these, through these walls. And that system creates a variety of rooms of different qualities, different sites, different heights, different ways in, but not necessarily programmatically specific. So we didn't really look at the program because we, you know, programs change constantly. And at this moment, sort of multifunctional spaces, they don't, they, they hardly uh, exist anymore. You need to constantly be able to allow for different uses to, to, um, uh, to uh, occur within a space. Um, and so we typically try to sort of provide a strategy for difference that creates a variety of spaces that can be used in different ways. So maybe it can be used as a gallery space. Um, you can add um, sheetrock to the structure or you can leave it open and it can be uh, a library or a play space or uh, what have you. And so in this, we felt that the structure actually becomes part of this walled uh, garden and creating this filter uh, into, the, into, that, um, into that historic uh, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, garden. Um, we didn't win, which happens uh, often, um, but it's okay because you can also uh, use these ideas again and again and again. And so I think also what we've learned um, in the last 10 years is that ideas, they're sort of like tumbleweed and they continue to sort of tumble along and you will find other places where they can uh, exist. Um, so we were able to at least test this once uh, for a temporary exhibition we did in Amsterdam um, for uh, a collection um, and the, here you see the plan and here you see uh, an installation shot and what was interesting is so these were this is a private collection uh, you know of really artist 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 and so every room uh, had one artist so to say but because of the routing uh, you know every time you came sort of at the edge, you could choose the next um, sort of path, the next, uh, um, basically the relation between all these artists became um, um, very present through, you know, you as, a, as, a, as a, a visitor, as the audience choosing your path. And it's interesting, so people kept on coming back to sort of see different sequences and see different plots, if you want, uh, within the structure. So that's structure. And then, um, I will admit, so my, my thinking very much developed in, um, in the Netherlands where I studied and then in uh, Japan um, when I worked at SANA. And I think there the role of structure in the way uh, one thinks of architecture is very present. Um, and then I came to this country and I realized form is very important. And uh, I had to say this because one of the first people that I came across um, who was so explicit about it was uh, Scott Cohen, who you probably know quite well here. Mm. And I, I realized it's actually really difficult for us to speak about form, um, specifically in the sort of the in the way somebody like Scott Cohen can be so precise about form. And I realized that this is something um, that I hadn't hadn't really thought about. 
Um, and so we've been here obviously now for a while, and I and I we started to sort of develop a thinking around form and around shape and around also obviously the space that results uh, from it. Uh, and we got really interested in this idea of um, of ambiguity, of the sort of opposite of the diagram architecture. A diagram is so simple that if you don't get it, you must be really you know you, you mustn't understand anything. Um, so, and it's also, there's only one way to get it, right? The diagram is so simple that the entire world should get it in this one single way. Um, we got very interested in this idea that you don't fully get it or that you can create forms that could be understood in many different ways. The same way if you look at clouds, you know, and somebody sees a, a crocodile and the other sees the Eiffel Tower, um, they're both fine, right? There is not necessarily a single way that this thing should be seen. Um, and so we got interested in this idea of how can you control uh, a form in some way that it reveals, but that it also maybe uh, hides uh, a little bit. And so I don't know if people know uh, what is in here. Anybody? What's wrapped? Sorry. Yes. But everybody thinks, of course, that it could be something else, but he knew it. Right? <laughs> Nobody else knew it was a sewing. Okay, no, I know. Well, it is a sewing machine, but it is exactly that that you that there is some sort of interest also in the discovery maybe of what it could be, and that there is no right necessarily or wrong uh, with that. And I spoke a little bit earlier as well, and maybe um, um, the idea of PS1 and this idea of process as a way to come to an outcome is very important for us in thinking of form where, for instance, the material processes are the one that define the, the final form. So rather than coming up with a form in the beginning and figuring a way to build it, you could also think of a process, and the outcome of that process gives you a form, and that's actually the thing that you end up uh, um, finding as the final uh, product. So a good example of that, of that sort of process-based uh, design and something that speaks about this ambiguous form is a, is a project we did in 2012 uh, in Korea, which was actually our first uh, built project, a gallery space um, in the sort of historic center. On the left is where the palace um, used to be. And you see some of these old courtyard homes. Uh, this is where the people who worked in the palace used to live. Now it's a very nice pedestrian area uh, in the north part of Seoul. Uh, and because it's so nice, a lot of galleries and uh, move in. And our client is a contemporary arts uh, gallery, Kukche, which stands for international. Uh, and they asked us to make their third space there, K3, um, uh, to complement sort of the two buildings that they already had within this very historic, uh, dense area. And if you make a space for contemporary art, the first question is flexibility, right? And everything is white, and everything is very simple and straight. So basically, they ask us, make the biggest box possible here. That's the brief, right? And it's often the brief, if you don't know what the future is going to be, is just make the biggest box possible. And contemporary art specifically likes uh, big uh, uh, white cubes. Um, and so we thought that's uh, easy, um, but they also needed something that would, could, be, could sort of draw attention, yet fit well within this historic uh, neighborhood. Um, but first we started to work on this sort of very diagrammatic approach of what is the biggest box, and we decided to um, uh, push sort of all the circulation uh, out. We, there was two floors uh, underneath with, a, with an auditorium and some uh, uh, offices and storage, <coughs> and the roof was also accessible. And we came up with this very clear um, singular diagram, if you want, right? The box, all the stuff out, that's the building. Um, and then we started to think of presenting this, uh, but we also realized it's too hard and it's too simple maybe for this neighborhood. So we, on our way out, decided to wrap the model. Um, uh, we, we, we grabbed the elastic sort of stocking that we had um, lying in the office. And we thought, what if we create sort of this permanent uh, uh, veil or sort of um, fog around this building so you actually never can fully read where's the edge uh, of this box, something that creates a sort of a, a, a translucent skin um, and indeed sort of starts to also reveal or uh, um, hide some of the uh, stuff that is uh, behind, uh, which was nice in model. And it was even nice um, in digital model. Uh, but then also the question was, what is it? 
right? What is it in reality? Um, because we want to make these things as well. So we needed something strong, we needed something pliable. We did not want to construct this form, if you understand. We didn't want to triangulate it, put a structure behind it, and build this shape. There was no interest in the shape. There was, there was an interest in the effect that this uh, veil could have, but it needed to be very soft and, and pliable, yet strong, um, because it's outside. Uh, and so we came across um, a very interesting material that is very strong and very pliable, as you can see, which is chain link mesh. Um, so it's metal, but it is, through its geometry, actually quite elastic and quite, uh, it can take on very beautiful double curved uh, surfaces, as you can see um, here. <laughs> and so uh, we, we built a model in the office and that seemed to work. This is one to 10 scale, the largest scale you can buy this material uh, in, which is basically, uh, uh, it's like three eighths of an inch uh, diameter, but this is not the right scale uh, of the building. So we actually uh, went to Alibaba.com and ended up in uh, a town in uh, um, China, a very small town uh, full of uh, um, workshops, and we ended up welding uh, half a million rings uh, together um, with the town. Uh, and we created 14 of these uh, um, um, swaths. Um, and so 60 people together worked on this, on this, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, meshes, basically, that we produced. Uh, and the building in Korea, a sort of crude, simple diagram was, was built, and then the mesh arrived, and we sort of draped uh, the building, and we were able to stitch them together in a seamless um, way. And so now you see the building sitting here in the, in the historic uh, neighborhood, and when you, when you get close to it, you actually never see it as its whole form. It's so dense the area that only you can sort of walk around it, but you can't really understand what is its form. And we like, um, there's this fable, I think it's an Indian fable, where uh, seven blind men uh, touch an elephant and they all see something different. And that's actually a little bit the thing uh, uh, that you have when you walk around here. There's never sort of one way um, of, of seeing it. Um, and so the, the mesh sort of peels out to create sort of this threshold uh, coming in. So every time you go into the building or you move around it, you're sort of in this in-between uh, space. And it's exactly those things that we had poke out that define uh, the form. And so in this case, you know, the material process and sort of the strategy of design is actually what generated the, the ultimate uh, uh, form. Um, and you see between day uh, and night, also the, the presence of the box really Changes depending on how you know how strongly uh, the light uh, reflects on the on the skin. So then uh, we got really interested in wrapping um, and shrink wrapping things, and we started to just with a hair dryer shrink wrap a whole bunch of things in the office um, to play to actually develop sort of an understanding of of this idea of hiding and, and showing. Um, a blob hides everything, right? Uh, a diagram uh, reveals everything. Somewhere in between, there's maybe a beautiful space where sort of hints are given about what, you know, what is happening uh, uh, behind. Um, and then we were asked to do a show um, <clears throat> at, the, at the storefront for art and architecture, uh, which Stephen Hall uh, designed with Vito Acconci. And um, I mean, the most beautiful thing about this project is the way it speaks about the, the, the sort of the edge, right, between the institutional space and the public space, right, and how uh, this facade that can completely open suddenly creates a very strong connection between the, the institutional space and the outside space. And I think that's one of the strongest and most beautiful um, parts of this uh, project. And so when we were asked to design a show here, um, we said we need to have the doors open, but it was winter. Um, and so we couldn't, right? It needed to be closed, also security and what have you. Um, but then we thought, well, maybe we just winterize storefront. So we, we actually sh shrink wrapped uh, the, the building. Um, we used uh, one of these people that wraps <coughs> yachts and, and helicopters. And he came by and he, he basically wrapped uh, uh, the, the entire storefront, creating a completely new sort of uh, appearance of the same uh, uh, space uh, within the city and also creating ways maybe um, that storefront hadn't been necessarily seen um, uh, yet. And then to build on on this idea of, of openness and maybe even tolerance, uh, very quickly somebody else saw it also as a very different thing. Um, they saw it as a canvas. 
And so, um, you know, this, this happened uh, right after. And I think it's a, we, we were trying to celebrate right, the tension between the institutional space and the city, and right here you, you, you have it. Um, when we continued to work on um, a permanent building, we, we basically developed this, this language. Um, we, 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 we worked on the design uh, for an artist um, uh, community, uh, basically a series of studios and some gallery space in Bushwick in, uh, in, in Brooklyn. And we used this idea of the frame, so to say, so some, some sort of uh, areas that uh, define uh, openings, the connections to the outside world as the things that hold uh, sort of their edge. And then we used um, um, the spaces uh, in between actually sort of to drape them and to connect them and to use this strategy of, of wrapping actually now to explore them really in sort of permanent uh, built form. Um, and so here actually the process uh, does generate a certain uh, form, a form that shows, you know, certain uh, articulation and hides and creates completely new types of spaces on the inside where suddenly the light and the way, and this is maybe the first time that we started to sort of understand how light also would work uh, within these double uh, curved uh, uh, surfaces and how we could, for instance, create um, spaces. And these are all renders, so this is not true or it's um, not built, but it is uh, uh, <laughs> representation. We did, did not succeed building this uh, uh, building. But here you see how, for instance, in one space, through this uh, strategy, you can have both a clear story and a skylight in the same uh, sort of space and have the have the 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 the, the space basically negotiate those two different uh, orientations. In this process, we um, we 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 discovered this guy uh, at the block group in um, in Switzerland, Dutch guy who's doing his PhD, who's very interested in uh, fabric formwork, um, but in a very precise way. So fabric formwork to date has been very. Uh, unpredictable, but he's actually working on a certain script that better sort of helps you understand how to cast concrete in fabric, and it is something that we continue to uh, explore, and, and sort of this led us, speaking about tumbleweed, to um, uh, a sort of pool um, house uh, we're working on now in Spain that actually uses that technique to make this very thin sort of shell uh, concrete. And this is the first time I showed this image because very recently we won, uh, strangely enough, uh, a number of buildings in Hangzhou uh, for the Asian Games that should open in uh, 2022. So, um, you know, something that starts somewhere ends up somewhere completely um, different. So now um, the last section, it's where you where we combine these two ideas, the idea of the open structure and the idea of the open form, and maybe where the structure helps inform the, the outer form, but where, um, yeah, where you see these two coming together. And maybe, and we've been excited about recently indeed working with Noel on some furniture, but also now with Friedman Benda um, <clears throat> on a number of uh, outdoor uh, seating elements where we use this idea of a, of a frame that creates some sort of suggestion of, of seating um, without necessarily prescribing how. So a bench, you know, obviously looks like a bench, and so you know there's only one way to use it. But we are here interested in using the structure and the processes, the same sort of uh, chain link that we used in, in Korea, to create um, a, a formal uh, uh, element or, uh, yeah, a, a structure that can be used and could be interpreted in different ways. You could sit on it with four or two or three. Um, and so we're producing an, a, a few of these now. We're, we, we just produced uh, the second, and the third is being um, uh, uh, soon uh, produced um, as well. And so we're making this family of, uh, of objects, which, again, are used in ways we hadn't uh, anticipated. This was just came back uh, in. On a, on a little bit larger scale, we recently um, did a project with Mini. Um, Mini used to make cars, but these days nobody wants cars anymore. And so Mini is interested not so much in the car, but more what Mini stands for, uh, which is well-designed small things. And so they've been getting into different uh, uh, aspects of life, uh, one of them being living. And so they asked us to make a concept uh, home uh, called Mini 
living for the Salone in uh, Milan, uh, I think last year, yeah, um, which needed to um, communicate, it's temporary, but an idea of how we can uh, live with a lighter footprint uh, within the city. And so this is a three bedroom um, home um, on a, um, uh, it's a 50 square meters, uh, yeah, um, um, no, it's less. It's, it's two and a half by 10, so it's 25 square meter, 250 square foot uh, lot, um, which consists of a, a structure, a prefabricated structure that fits in a shipping container. It's these three floors and they fit within um, a, a container. They can be shipped and they get installed. And then depending on where they are on site, they get wrapped with a, with a fabric as a jacket in a way that depending on the, on the climate basically creates a, a, a filter and, uh, and an edge uh, um, between these um, uh, different stacked platforms and the, and the environment. And so for Milan, we wrapped it in two layers, an outer layer that actually picks up particles, uh, um, dirt from the, from the environment, and the rain actually washes it down, and a second layer, a double, uh, more elastic layer that creates privacy at certain uh, places. Very quickly uh, installed, so off-site fabricated, installed in, a, in a, like a day and a half, in this little alleyway um, in, um, in uh, Milan, uh, sort of an industrial uh, area. And so here uh, you see uh, the house. And between the different levels, between the different layers, we used, again, a translucent or even a, a transparent and elastic uh, material. So that sort of the awareness of the other, again, uh, is present you know, between uh, the different floors. And so from the ground floor up, you can actually see all the way you know, through the house up to the, the garden, which sits uh, uh, on top. Here you see one of the, um, this is actually the master bedroom, um, the, the, the sleeping uh, pod, uh, and uh, another uh, other sleeping um, area. We made all the um, mechanical uh, sort of visible. So here uh, somewhere you see uh, transparent uh, we, we collect the, the water up on the roof, and that's basically used uh, in the for the for the uh, shower and the and the restroom, and then the top uh, with its garden sort of overlooking uh, out over the over the city, and then uh, at night obviously it sort of transforms uh, and it becomes much more um, uh, permeable uh, again depending on on the light. So then I'm going to, I want I know I added one more thing, but um, UC Davis, uh, University of California Davis Museum, again, we needed to create something that had a certain um, accessibility, if you want, or openness, um, something uh, that would introduce the arts on a campus that doesn't really have the arts as part of their um, curriculum and of their daily life. It's uh, the Ag School in Northern California in the Central Valley. Um, it's very hot. Uh, most people there are working on you know, cloning sheep or um, inseminating bees, but, but the arts are not necessarily part of their daily life. Since many of the students do end up, or not many, but some of them end up working in the, in the wine area, Sonoma Valley and Napa Valley, um, actually some of the donors said, we need to bring the arts to campus. And so they built a performing arts center, and they asked uh, us through a competition to work on a, um, uh, a arts museum. Um, again, uh, without a collection uh, for an audience that doesn't exist yet. There was a program, but the program was very open-ended. And so we needed to create something um, both in its presence and in its operation. So in some way, you could say both in its structure and in its form that allowed the other in, right? That allowed interpretation and that allowed use. And so we looked at the vernacular, the idea of the vernacular also um, with regards to this agricultural um, space. But rather than a single sort of vernacular, we were interested in this idea of layering, uh, of diffusion again, of some sort of maybe more enigmatic presence of the vernacular um, within, uh, within the space. 
Um, the site, we covered the entire site. It was a 70,000 uh, 70, square foot site. It was a design built competition. So it meant that we were actually fully responsible for the budget uh, um, as well, together with the builder, of course. Um, but it was a challenge because obviously, you know, everybody wants the greatest building, but at the same time here, we were fully responsible also for uh, the cost. And the challenge was that the program was half the size of the site. And we thought we need to create something larger, something bigger, something more present, um, and something that actually really incorporates the exterior and the outside and the environment uh, as part of the building itself. So we decided let's start with covering the entire site with this open structure, something that just creates a variety of spaces, uh, spaces with different qualities and different proportions. And we will see how the use will um, uh, fit in. And then we thought about its presence on this flat, horizontal um, landscape of the Central Valley. We thought this slight sort of silhouette might give enough already curiosity, if you want. But it was very important for us that from every side, you would see a different building. You would, see, you would read something differently. So as you, um, and that's something we developed sort of within the process, uh, the form was very much about also creating sort of, um, yeah, different points of view from every angle. And so this strategy, gave us, if you want, the tapestry of different spaces, inside, outside, light, dark, open, and closed. And we felt this is enough sort of difference for a program that doesn't exist yet uh, to sort of find their way um, in. Um, we did have to obviously set sort of a first uh, use, um, which is the current uh, use, uh, with a series of uh, uh, galleries, uh, a block of galleries. Here, you see courtyards everywhere in between this is the educational space, a classroom and an art making space, um, operations, and this large sort of public covered plaza that really reaches out to the, to the campus itself. We wanted the, the campus actually to really sort of continue under this large roof, this big canopy that we created, then um, is, the, is basically the, the thing that creates both its presence, but also um, uh, is, is the thing that, that um, um, affects and 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 triggers uh, the experience, or uh, yeah, basically affects the the experience um, underneath. Um, and so, we thought, how to now create this 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 more diffuse um, um, experience underneath? Um, and we started to look at light and shadow. And since the sun is so important, you know, not just for in the uh, not just for um, these. Ag, the, the the idea of agriculture it was it was all it was in the middle of this drought and so the environment became a very strong sort of uh, had a very strong effect on our thinking at this moment and we felt it's really important for the students also to think of the environment as part of the experience and we started to work with light and shadow and try to think of how can we control light and shadow um, in uh, in sort of shaping this tapestry of spaces underneath can we make shadow that is sharp and blurry can we create edges with shadow um, uh, and what have you. And so what is the system in which you can create this diffusion of difference? Um, and ultimately, we found uh, and we decided on working with uh, triangulated beams. Um, some of these systems you see in sort of the primary steel, then secondary steel, and then infill. And we realized with sort of singular infill, with one layer, you can only create sort of one type of, of shadow. But through creating a deeper a zone, again, maybe similar to in, uh, in Korea, uh, the light really trickles through um, and creates sort of this layered um, shadow. And through working with this triangular beams between the primary structure, suddenly we got three, say, parameters to play with that could create this different, uh, this different uh, infills. And because of that, the different systems. So spacing, orientation, and the openness gave us um, a, a way to, within the same system, create sort of this very um, uh, great variety of different um, uh, shades. And so in the public area where there was art, it's maybe more dense because they wanted to control the light a little bit more. And then at other places further away, we could space it further uh, and, and have uh, also make sure that we met that very tight budget. Um, structure was built. We went back to China and actually with this, uh, a similar group produced 982 uh, unique uh, beams, uh, aluminum uh, beams that were all installed uh, in a quite uh, precise pattern. Um, also thinking very much about um, sort of the joinery because you see that the, um, 
the, the, the widest coil of aluminum uh, was like five and a half feet, so we needed to also see how the, all these things got attached. Because see here how this sort of different um, a tapestry is created. And so here, um, the building in relation to the landscape, in relation to this flat agricultural um, land, uh, this big roof sort of reaching out to uh, the audience, if you want, to the campus, very um, low. You can almost uh, touch it. This is where most students will come from. Uh, and so very accessible and, 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 and permeable. And then the space sort of rises up to 32 uh, feet um, up in the center. And that's actually where you enter uh, the building. And you see how uh, you know that space is animated by uh, the daylight uh, constantly changing as the sun sort of moves over over um, uh, the canopy. One of the courtyards. And so these courtyards, they're not just outside spaces. They're also used as classrooms and as art making spaces and exhibition spaces. And in the galleries, we used sort of the same idea that we spoke about before, about the sequencing, where Again, the students can sort of choose their own path through the system rather than being told sort of top down, you know, what they need to see. It's they can construct their path through through the building. And then I was very excited the other day. Somebody sent me this. Um, so suddenly um, it became sort of this um, um, maybe uh, I, it did. Uh, is the first museum that was lead platinum, but we're not so interested necessarily in those scorecards, but more actually the idea suddenly becoming uh, tangible, this idea of you know environmental um, experience. Not, I think awareness is maybe too big a word, but at least that you understand how you can have the context and how the environment itself can have an effect on the experience, on the building, on the way uh, people move through. And I wanted to end uh, with a piece that built a little bit on this thing we did for, um, for, for Milan, which speaks about this idea of filtration uh, and edge, um, which is the installation uh, we did for um, the Chicago Biannual last year, together with an artist, Anna Kovacci, um, which we were asked to do something in uh, a very beautiful uh, conservatory, the greenhouse in um, in, um, in a very um, challenged neighborhood in Chicago, uh, which is a beautiful space, like a bubble within this um, intense urban um, area. And we thought this idea of, of, of uh, how can we think of filtration? How do, do we think of layering? How do we think of the environment? And how do we um, create uh, um, a, a, a project, if you want, uh, that in some way makes us contemplate that idea? We worked together with a... With a a, uh, a composer, and this is basically, uh, these are four enclosures for four uh, musical instruments. Um, and they are made out of uh, air filtering materials, so they clean uh, the air. Um, and so the shape of them actually comes from the ergonomics uh, 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 that, the, that the musicians need. So this is the flute, the flutist, right? Here we have the saxophone. This is the trombone. It was very difficult because he, he has a very big cantilever. And this is the, the soprano. And our, to go back to this idea of, of the open work, so we worked with uh, Veronica Krausas, this composer, and she wrote basically a score, but a score that could be freely interpreted by the musicians. So it was a very much an open work uh, in that sense uh, as well. Um, and so I will end with a short video that, um, that shows how um, these musicians interpreted that uh, uh, piece. I think I have to do this.